I started to work with telecommunications in the 80s, uh, initially online in 1985. Well, to be, you know, if, if you really go back, in reality, I started to work with mail art in 1979, 1980. And I practiced mail art until 82. When I, when I turned to digital, I pretty much stopped um, any analog mode of creation and production because 82 was really a radical moment for me. Once I turned to digital and holographic in 83, and then 85 with the Minitel and the early forms of networking, digital networking. And then 86, I started with telepresence. So it's, you know, once I made that shift from analog to digital, there was no turning back. But before, and, and for these three years, in a very intense manner, I did work with mail art. So in reality, my interest for networking and communication at the distance goes back, goes back to that. And that goes back at least to Ray Johnson and, and the early 60s when mail art really started to, to, uh, to evolve. But my point is that uh, communication at the distance in the analog realm was primarily asynchronous, like a message in a bottle. Right? And once you shift the conversation into digital and to electronics, you are in a very different type of environment. Um, I was not just interested in using technologies, I was interested in intervening and, and understanding that a new culture was uh, in the process of being developed. I was interested in participating in helping shape that, that, new, that new culture. So some of these questions that were initially addressed but in, 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 at, at this analog uh, level to me, would uh, experience a, a, an intensification and a, a uh, escalation of complexity that was completely unlike mail art itself, even though all forms of networking share a common interest. Uh, just as painting might share a common interest, say, with printmaking, they're not the same discipline, they're, it's not the same practice, they're not, it's not the same type of work. So what would be the modality of communication as an art medium? in this new emerging yet to be developed digital culture that was the question in 84 85 86 so i worked with uh, video phone fax live television and a number of different the minitel network and a number of different um, environments and in 86 i added a physical dimension to networking and that was one early contribution that is uh, networking was predicated primarily on the exchange and transformation of sound text and images, screen-based, uh, sending and receiving. And they did do work like that too. But the question was, what if I could exert physical presence in the other environment, not, not just send a picture through the phone, but have a physical presence in the other environment or allow somebody else to experience this environment. That's when I invented telepresence art. By coupling robotics to telecommunications, allowing people to jump off the telecommunication link and be embodied in an invented robot that found itself in an invented environment, all of this created specifically for each and individual uh, work. So the interface was unique, the body was unique, the environment was unique to each individual artwork. I developed that from 1986 pretty much throughout uh, the 90s. And I used telepresence because, you know, after 86, 96, 2006, slowly telepresence was becoming, started to become an element in the repertoire of artists in general that Initially, I made telepresence artworks because the form didn't exist, the medium didn't exist. The robots were handmade. Today you can buy robotic parts on Amazon, but that, that didn't exist. Everything had to be handmade, right? And today you have the internet, so the network is in place. You had no network in place, so if you wanted to network, you had to set it up. You had to set up the link. Two-party link, three-party link, five-party link, you had to set it up. So everything had to be done, right? So, in that context, uh, I initially created these individual telepresence works, but I myself too, in the course of time, for example, in my Genesis piece, 
from uh, 1999, which is a piece of bioart. I used an element of telepresence at the service of the bioart dimension of the work. Genesis is not primarily telepresence. It uses, because by 99, after more than 10 years of development, telepresence started to become a medium, a form, right? That you could use in other larger contexts, which is natural for any form. So, Uirapuru is a piece that I did in 1999. In fact, it was my last, let's call it, pure telepresence work. But by doing so, it was already hybridized, really, truly, because what Uirapuru does is you have a fly, now drones are all the rage, but you know, I handmade this flying fish. Right? And, and it, it was in an environment where you had two pathways possible. Right? One led you to a VR interface and the other led you to the telepresence interface, but everything was online, interconnected through the internet. So if you came to it through the internet, you had to do the same thing. You had to choose whether you went into the telepresence side or you went to the virtual reality. Of course, you could come back and go to the other. And you could do that physically in the space as well. But all of it is interconnected in what way? In complex ways. So in the room, I had birds. Right? I rented an Amazon, a, a server in the Amazon. Paid the guy in the Amazon. I, I, I told him, look, I want to ping your server, but I don't want you to think you know, it's an attack. So I want to pay you. It's going to bother you a little bit, and I want to pay you for that, so you know what's going to happen. He said, fine. So he knew it's going to come from a Tokyo IP address, right? And he's going to get that ping from that server, and as long as he got that ping, it was fine. He knew it was not an attack. So that pinging from Tokyo to the Amazon was basically to track the, the time, automatically, of course, the time that it takes for communication to happen, to see if the internet is more busy or less busy. That led to an increase or a, dec a decrease in the singing pattern of the birds, the robotic birds in the room. So when the birds sang more often, you knew the net was more busy. When they sang less often, you knew the net was less busy. But of course, the fact that you were physically there manipulating everything in the VR world or in the telepresence side affected it. Or if you were from home, say in the VR realm, you increased internet activity. So anything you did, or anybody else for that matter, would make the birds sing more or less throughout the day. So networking brought it all together, right? And affected the behavior in telepresence, affected the behavior in the virtual world, and affected people's behavior in the room. So again, this is to say that what was perceived in, at the end of the 20th century as discrete entities, telepresence on the one hand, networking on the other, VR on the other, Uirapuru makes a very clear statement that all of these entities that are perceived as discrete will become one and the same. They will become one environment. There will be no difference between telepresence, virtual reality, networking. It's all the same. It's all integrated. Right? So Uirapuru makes that happen and gives you the lived experience of that happening through this very whimsical forest like where you have a blue light in the back so if you look up if you look at the trees the blue is the sky but if you look at the fish which is flying above the fish ab above the trees then the blue in relation to the fish is ocean but it's the same blue it's the same space you see so it's all very whimsical very fluid very playful and then you go into the VR world oh and your interface is a fish too right so you grab the fish and in, in VR, you grab the fish, there is a fish avatar that is flying in a similar type of environment. Uh, and, and that is you, right? But people are coming online and interacting with you. While this is happening, the flying fish in the physical room is being tracked by a sonar that is feeding its corresponding avatar autonomously in the VR world. It's all interconnected. So anything that anyone does affects the behavior of anybody else in the space. And the same is true in the telepresence interface. You grab a fish. When you lift it, you notice that the image 
the, the fish was sitting on top of, of, of a video image live. And when you grab it, you notice that you are distancing yourself from it. And then you also see that the flying fish went up. So you're getting a live feed from the, from the fish. But when you put it down, people on the internet gain control. So if you're not doing anything, but the fish is flying around, somebody else remotely is doing that. It's all interconnected. But if you are doing it, then they see it. Right? So it's all, and of course, that makes the birds sing more often. So it's all interconnected. You know, when we say communication, usually people think about, oh, am I being clear enough? Are you understanding me? So clarity is at the service of making sure that you understand what I'm saying. And why do I, why is it important that you understand what I'm saying? Because I want to get something through to you, right? And that usually means that I want you to understand my emotions so you respond empathically towards me, or I want you to understand what I'm asking so you do what I'm asking. So the clarity is at the service of passing a message through. That is not what I'm talking about, right? I'm interested in communication in a more fundamental sense. I'm interested in communication as as it relates to responsibility. Responsibility both in, in terms of what it implies to be in contact with another person, but also the possibility of response. So for me, communication is an open channel. It's not about persuasion, it's not about clarity, it's about the possibility of mutual transformation when we engage with another, right? And it doesn't have to be human, necessarily, right? Uh, and that means that Communication implies the coming together of discrete elements that are only perceived as discrete uh, because of distance, right? Because in reality, everything is interconnected. One person that is never in con contact with anybody else couldn't develop reason or, or couldn't develop the level of social interaction that uh, being together with others would enable one to develop. So. This, this notion of coming together, the possibility of contact, the possibility of response, opening a channel for mutual transformation, to me that's what communication means. And I also see it at the very basis of the physical reality as a whole, not, not just uh, as an idea. Think about, for example, the uh, DNA by itself doesn't do anything. It needs an enclosure, right? So now you have a cell that keeps that DNA, but then the DNA gets into contact with another and transforms another. And now you have multiple cells. Now you have the origin. Through the communication of these individual cells, you have the origin of a multicellular organism. So the possibility of contact in communication is what makes the human, for example, possible in the first place. On a very material level, we're not talking about some theoretical speculation, right? But then, you also realize that on a higher poetic philosophical level, uh, you arrive at, at communication as this enabler, this, this, so this element that allows you to sustain relationships and forge identity and, and, and enable uh, consciousness to evolve, because I don't see consciousness as existing inside the brain or inside the human being. I see it as as being uh, the result of uh, biological interaction. So, to me, communication understood in this sense that I have always defended, this larger fundamental sense, uh, would be, to me, I think, the united uh, principle of my work.